Hello and welcome to the online service from Nambour Anglican Parish, South East Queensland, Australia. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the priest in charge of this parish in the Anglican Church, Southern Queensland. This service is a brief explanation of the Christian gospel, a brief act of worship, and we pray that in listening to it and watching it, you will find encouragement in your search for God, if you're searching for God, or in your relationship with God, if you want to express faith and hope. Here is a verse from the Apostle John to open our service today. From 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. peace. We are the body of Christ. His, His spirit, spirit is, is with us. us. The peace of the Lord be always with you and, and also with you.
Members of our parish are invited to give their support by online giving. Receive the link on our website. Prayer over our gifts. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. And now we come to the ministry of the word. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today's reading is from Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Glory to, to you, you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned round and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, 
to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them these things, told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Thanks to you, to you Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us affirm our faith together. We, we believe, believe in one God, who made and loves all that is. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was born, lived, died and rose again, and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who calls, equips and sends out God's people and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I thought I'd adopt a more relaxed approach on this Easter and prepare and deliver this sermon from my office here in our Anglican Parish sit down and have a chat to you. Uh, I would have a fireside chat if I had a, a fire here, but sit down and chat with you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this great founding event of the Christian Church. It bears on so many important issues, the resurrection, the reliability and truth of the Christian faith, who Jesus act actually is, and the difference he makes in our lives. It's so important to look at it. Now, one of the challenges we have in... Uh, thinking about the story of Jesus and the resurrection is the very familiarity of many of the stories. You know, if you have a picture or a painting on your wall or something that's part of the furniture, after a while, unless you really care about it, you tend to not look at it carefully. It becomes just part of the background. And then maybe you look at it from a different angle and you think, wait a minute, I've never seen that. I've never seen it from that angle. I've never seen those things about it. So I'd just like to invite you think with me about some strange aspects or unusual or interesting aspects of the of this resurrection account. Just to put it into context, there are quite a number of accounts of the encounters with the risen Jesus and his disciples. St Paul says to the Corinthians that over 500 people met and talked to Jesus after he died, alive again. In his risen form. So uh, they were not just uh, hallucinations or phantasmic appearances, but really uh, quite real encounters, according to the evidence we have, uh, ranging over a number of weeks uh, across a geographical spread and amongst um, quite a number of people. Today in John chapter 20, we, re we read really one of the first of the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And the thief character is Mary Magdalene, that disciple of Jesus who was very uh, appreciative of Jesus' ministry and one of his most devoted early followers. I'm reading from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. John focuses on Mary Magdalene here, but uh, his words, the words of Mary, indicate that she was one of a number of women who went there. We don't know where they have put him. John focuses on her part in the story. The other Gospels tell us there were other women who had been with her there and come there and gone to the uh, tomb that morning to anoint the body of Jesus properly for his, um, for his uh, burial. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, of course, so Peter and the other beloved disciple, they run to the tomb, and you know the story there, as we've heard it read. There are seven interesting or peculiar, perhaps would be the best word, <clears throat> excuse me, peculiar aspects to this story. Maybe not peculiar to us because we're so familiar with it, but we, if we stop and think about it for a while, they strike as being a little odd. The first one um, 
is that there is no, in this story or in any of the other stories, an actual uh, account of Jesus coming out of the tomb and being seen to rise from the dead by eyewitnesses. The reason why this is peculiar, it's peculiar by its absence. It's like this, it's like the um, Sherlock Holmes story where the dog that didn't bark becomes the hinge point of the story. Why didn't the dog bark? Um, why did the gospel writers not tell the story the way you would expect them to tell the story if they were making up the story of the resurrection of Jesus? Uh, if you were concocting a fake story of the resurrection of Jesus, then it would be almost ir irresistible for the ancient writers to have some witnesses there and the tomb goes, gets rolled back and out comes Jesus in his grave clothes and there it is, people witnessing the resurrection. There are no witnesses of the rising of Jesus from the dead. People meet him after he has come to life again, but not in the process as we're watching it actually happen in real time, watching him come out of the tomb. That's the first strange or peculiar thing about it. Not peculiar, of course, um, if they're telling the story just the way it happened, but peculiar if you're sort of looking on it and asking the question, uh, why didn't they, uh, what if they made up the story? They surely would not have made it up that way. The second peculiarity of the story is really like the first, that the, uh, the one I've just mentioned, that is the first witnesses of, to the risen Jesus, the first people to meet him are a bunch of women. Here, Mary Magdalene, who meets him in the garden, a little further down. After Peter and John go back, um, um, she she's crying there in the garden, and then she meets what she thinks to be the gardener, and um, she has a conversation with him, and then realizes it's Jesus. Now, in the Jewish world of the first century, uh, the testimony of women wasn't front rank, and given the same weight as men. And it's intriguing that the first witnesses in the story are actually women who then go and tell the, the other disciples, look, the Lord is risen. We've seen him. Uh, this, too, um, would not commend the story to a sceptical audience. If you're going to, as it were, make up a story about the resurrection of Jesus, then the first and most powerful witnesses you would probably put in would be the men, if you were in the culture of the day, not the women. The reason why the women are in the story is not is because that's actually why it happened. They were the people on the spot. They were the people to whom Jesus first revealed himself in his risen state. That's a second peculiarity. A third peculiarity is the fact that um, the, the body is missing. Now, of course, it's not, it's not um, a peculiarity. Um, it's, it's quite an obvious thing that if Jesus is risen, the body, when they go to the tomb, will be missing. But the suggestion that the body has been taken by someone is the first suggestion made by Mary. She says um, in the reading here, um, uh, when she speaks to the angels in the tomb, she says, they say to her, why, woman, why are you crying? She says, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. So the story introduces a little red herring, the possibility that this is a, a case of a grave robbery and the body of Jesus has somehow been taken away by some other people. This, of course, is what people have actually said, uh, opposing and being sceptical of the resurrection. This is really was, as it were, um, a violation of the tomb and the body removed for whatever reason um, and this is the way it was. So again, if you wanted to... Uh, uh, allay that idea. Why would you bring it into the story? So the, 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 the tomb is empty and the body is missing. This is a peculiar aspect of the story. Again, going back to my first point, you're much, raised, much more likely to expect them to see the body dead and then the body coming to life again and moving out and so on. Um, but to introduce the idea that someone's taken the body away is an unusual one if you're concocting the story but very real and very understandable if that's the way it actually happened. But the first idea of Mary was not that Jesus had risen, but that someone had stolen his body, his corpse. In other words, 
the most natural explanation. We also want to note in passing that the early witnesses to the resurrection did not expect to see Jesus risen again, despite the fact that he had given them clear indications that he would do so. So it's not a matter of the story is told. Here are people um, hyped up on emotional wish fulfillment who imagined they saw Jesus. No, they weren't. They were not expecting him. The fourth peculiar aspect is the angels in the tomb. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot, the other at the foot. And they asked her. Now, the story doesn't make much of the angels, these two men, if you like, two angels in white sitting in the tomb, um, seated, as it were, like guards on either side of where Jesus' body had been. What are they doing there? Why are they there? Why does she not react to them? Does she not realise they're angels? Perhaps she didn't. Maybe she thought they were some other other people. Um, and uh, it's a very peculiar exchange between this woman and the angels. Um, she's so preoccupied by her dismay at the empty tomb and the removal of the Lord that she doesn't seem to, as it were, express surprise that she's seen the angels. Because remember, uh, just a few minutes before, Peter and John, who'd been in the tomb, who are actually in the tomb, before her, um, um, didn't see the angels. Didn't see the angels. See, Mary got to the tomb, we read at the beginning, the stone had been removed, and she went running immediately to Simon Peter, another disciple, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, we don't know where they put him. The women saw the tomb open, but didn't dare go in. Maybe they were frightened. But when Peter and the other disciple get to the tomb, they go in and they don't see any angels. Not long after, after the disciples have gone back, Mary's crying outside. She pokes her head in. She looks in. And she sees the two angels. Very strange encounter. Very strange encounter. Um, and what is strange is that she doesn't think it is strange. She doesn't react to the presence of the angels. Now, often in the Bible, where people see angels, they get upset, they get frightened, they get uh, awestruck, but this doesn't appear to happen here. Again, a peculiar part of the narrative, but often people, when they're emotionally in, in uh, wrought and in uh, traumatic situations, don't react in the normal way. They, they're so preoccupied with their own emotions, they don't react in the way that you might expect them to be. In other words, this has what J.B. Phillips called the ring of truth. Then to go back and talk about something else, the actual grave clothes. When Peter and the other disciple, perhaps John, the beloved disciple, go in, they, um, uh, the other disciple bends over and looks into the tomb with the strips of linen lying there. Then Simon Peter rushes in, sees the strips of linen lying there, the grave clothes, as well as the burial cloth, the sudarion, that used to be around Jesus' head, the body set, a separate cloth tied around um, the head of the uh, deceased, seeing them folded up there, the cloth folded up by itself, separate to the linen, um, the grave clothes appear not to suggest that the grave has been disturbed by robbers. They had been told by the women that someone had violated the tomb. But when they go in there, they find not the cloth all just ripped and put anywhere, but neatly down, lying there as if as it were, Jesus had just got out, stepped out of them, and unwrapped himself and got out of them, including the, the headpiece, the headcloth, a burial cloth for the head, um, folded up and just lying there, neatly put to one side. Um, and when the other disciple who reached the tomb first went inside, he saw and believed. What does he believe? Um, not that Jesus had risen from the dead. Is they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But what he believed was that this was an orderly departure from the tomb and that the, the body had not been raised. And then, of course, we come to, um, I think it's the, the, um, the sixth element in this uh, strange, peculiar aspect. 
the failure of, of Mary Magdalene to recognize Jesus. She um, famously is very emotional and then a man is there, Jesus is there in the garden. And, um, and then um, she turns around and sees Jesus there, but she doesn't realize it was Jesus. Woman, he says, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And then Mary said to her, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then they have a conversation. Now, again, this is peculiar. Why didn't she recognize him? This was the same Jesus that she'd known. She didn't immediately recognize it, perhaps because she wasn't expecting to see him. But also, it's also similar in one of the other narratives of the resurrection. There was something different about him. Same Jesus, but slightly different now in the power of his resurrection. Again, what's peculiar about all this, if you were going to tell the story to convince people that Jesus was really raised from the dead and there was no confusion about the matter, this is a highly unusual and unlikely thing that you put in, that um, to even raise the doubt that this was the real Jesus, that people didn't recognize. You would make it, I would imagine, unmistakably convincing that you'd met the real Jesus. Not someone that you actually just took a little while to realize was the real Jesus. But again, if it's the truth, it, it is told because it is true. Often, truth, as they say, is stranger than fiction and has the ring of truth to it. And then there's the final uh, and seventh matter that I want to talk about today, that is the, the ascension of Jesus, the, the departure of Jesus from his resurrection. Jesus says to Mary, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to thy father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and he, she told them what, and that he had said these things to her. When it says, do not hold on to me, she was actually embracing him. She had grabbed him to hold on to him. So uh, this is no uh, ghost, no phantasm, no hallucination. He's real and physical. He doesn't want her to touch him. Doesn't sorry. He doesn't. He's okay with, with her touching him. He just doesn't want her to hold on to him. He has to go. She can't keep him. He is now in the process of returning to the Father. So he's risen, but he's not going to stay in their presence. And he gives her a commission, go instead to my brothers and say, I am returning to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. He'll be around for a while, but he's on the way now, moving to the unseen world with God the Father. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting and unusual aspect. Jesus is not there, is there, but not there in, the, in quite the way he used to be there. He tries to distinguish between the continuity of the risen of Jesus from before and now Jesus in a new state. But there are seven unusual aspects of the resurrection story. And all the stories are like that. They are told of a piece. They are not told with an art to convince, but are told with a kind of artlessness, the way the story apparently unfolded. Um, that's the, the nature of historical documents. Uh, they're often artless and do not try to tie up all the loose ends or even to make it sound better than it actually was, but to tell the story the way it happened. So Mary becomes the first really witness, really the first witness to the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. That, I think, is the main thing for us to think about this Easter day. That we stand, as it were, on that early confidence that the Jesus who lived and died also rose again and is a living presence with us today. We can have confidence in that. May God bless you at this Easter time uh, as you uh, worship the living God and his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come. come. Your, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. Now, friends, uh, if you haven't already done so, I invite you perhaps to uh, for just take a minute and to get some wine or juice and some bread, perhaps, something simple. And we'll do together an act of spiritual communion and thanksgiving. So we invite you to join in a simple act of eating some bread or drinking some wine or juice as we give thanks for the salvation Christ has won for us in his death and resurrection. We'll just wait for a minute or so for you to get those things together if you haven't got them ready, and then we'll move forward with this spiritual communion. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Loving God in union with Christians throughout the world, we offer you praise and thanksgiving today. Even though we are unable to eat and drink the Lord's Supper together, we rejoice in our union with Christ and his body through the Spirit and rest in his saving gift of life. Amen. Friends, uh, Christian people around the world at the moment are are not able often to take communion together. Uh, so we invite you to have your own communion with us at home in an act of spiritual reception. So if you've got some bread and some juice or wine, uh, something to drink and something to eat, we'll remember the Lord's Supper together. Hear what St Paul said to the church about this. He received, he says, from the Lord what he also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray then for this act of spiritual communion. Loving God, in union with Christian people throughout the world and across the centuries, we listen to your holy word and receive the precious body and blood of your dear Son. 
in the bread and the wine. We offer you praise and thanksgiving. And even though we are exiled from tasting the bread of heaven and drinking the cup of life, we pray that you will unite us with all the baptized people of God and with your Son who gave his life for us. Amen. Let us eat and drink together. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen.